Rome conquers the world. Ambition and pride are apparent everywhere, exceeding anything seen previously. Colossal constructions are erected that defy the elements and nature. Impressive works intended for the comfort and security of its citizens and also to put the greatness of Rome on display. Inspired by inherited Etruscan and Greek building techniques, Rome went on to develop its own engineering and architectural skills and methods. Their construction work soon surpassed those of earlier cultures, making Roman civil engineering the most advanced in antiquity. The ambitious constructions undertaken by the Romans demonstrated their bold confidence, surpassed only by their level of engineering skills and new techniques that made these constructions possible. In order to understand these techniques and appreciate some of the most amazing works of the Empire, we are about to start an exciting journey, a journey that we will begin in the old Barcino, that today is Barcelona. Barcelona is a modern and cosmopolitan city, commercially and financially important. The level of culture that it offers has made it one of the most visited European cities. In the center of Barcelona is the so-called Gothic Quarter. After contemplating the large buildings and spacious avenues, this other Barcelona surprises the visitor. The narrow and labyrinthine streets of this neighborhood have changed little since medieval times. Here we find numerous churches and palaces. There are also several museums. Here is one of them, which is part of the Museum of the History of Barcelona. Hidden inside it is an unexpected surprise. Here within the medieval courtyard of the building, we have four imposing Corinthian columns from the glory days of Barcelona. These columns belong to the temple of Augustus. They are nine meters long, and their dimensions invite us to reconstruct in our minds the building from which they came. A temple about 43 meters long and 16 and a half wide. The religious center of the old Barcino. The design of this construction is based on a universally known element of architecture. The wooden beam. Due to its simplicity of use and versatility, wooden beams have been used throughout history. They allow the weight of the loads that they support to be redirected down to ground level via the extremities of the beam located in walls or on pillars, so creating useful free space directly underneath the load. With a series of beams supported between two walls, we can easily build a roof structure. When the purpose of the beam is to support the weight of masonry above an opening in a wall such as a doorway or window, or across the tops of pillars to create a portico, then it is called a lintel. 
The Great Temple of Augusto de Barcino was constructed in the same way as a portico. Pillars supporting a massive roof resting on lintels. This type of portico structure with strong stone lintels is found in important buildings in many Roman cities. Due to their simplicity, the beam and lintel were used extensively in ancient times even for small or even rustic constructions. But for more complex or large constructions, both have many limitations and drawbacks, since they are monolithic objects and can break suddenly when heavily loaded. Despite these limitations, some cultures produced great constructions successfully, even though using the lintel exclusively. Interesting examples of this were the Egyptian and Greek civilizations. Imposing and majestic constructions successfully impressed their citizens and honored their gods. But while impressive, they were not very practical. The real challenge for the engineer and architect appeared when the building was supposed to have a practical use. They had to solve this problem. To see how they did so, we will go to the parish of Posacos in the beautiful county of Valpasos in Portugal. Through this area ran the Roman road that linked Bracara Augusta, the current Portuguese city of Braga, with Astorica Augusta, today the Spanish city of Astorga, the famous Via Nova. Right here, the road came to the small River Calvo, which required the construction of a bridge. The Calvo is a small river, only seven meters or so wide, where the bridge is built. Despite this, a beamed structure would present major difficulties. Many Roman cargo vehicles carried loads of several tons. And as we have seen, the beam is weakest at its center, tending to bend under weight so that it eventually breaks. A beamed bridge would need thicker beams or shorter spans. This would mean more spans with more supports in the river. This would further impede the flow, incurring forces on the supports and so endangering the bridge. The solution that the engineers chose in these cases was the wedge arch made of wedge-shaped stones called dovelas, such as this one we see in the Roman Ponte do Aquino, the bridge that was built to cross the Calvo River. As with a beam, the arch directs the downward forces exerted on it towards the supports. But the wedge arch offers many advantages. A simple semicircular arch of Dovelas is constructed from stones, shaped to form blocks with sloping sides. Resting alongside each other with the sloped sides in contact, a semicircular arch is formed. Each block shares the forces of the load with its neighbors on either side. The forces are delivered to the extremities of the semicircle, horizontal surfaces that take the entire load. This technique offers enormous load-bearing capability. Once the arch is complete, massive superstructure can be supported by it, as well as the machinery and materials required for the construction. Because dovelas of various sizes and shapes can be made, this technique is versatile, allowing creative freedom to make other than strictly simple semicircular arches. By projecting an arch longitudinally over its center, we create the vault. And if we rotate it on the vertical axis that crosses its center, forming a spherical cap, we create a dome. 
that multiplies the architectural possibilities for creating impressive coverings for enclosing buildings. However, no civilization before Rome had dared to use the arch of Dovelas, the vault or the dome, that would maximize their infinite possibilities for Roman architects. This was due to the Roman mastery of the rules governing the distribution of forces in large structures that allowed them to exploit them in their great constructions. To understand what we're talking about, we will travel to the town of Vitel in the south of France. In the municipality of Viltel, we find the archaeological park of Oppidum d'Ambrusum. Much of its archaeological remains belong to the great house on the famous Via Domitia. An estatio, where rest facilities and other services were provided to travelers on this Roman road. One of the most relevant remains of the archaeological site of Ambrusum are these. The remains of Le Pont Ambrois, also called the Pont de Lunel. This bridge was built around 30 BC. After the disappearance of the empire, it was used for many centuries and towards the 14th century, it began to suffer from damage by the local inhabitants who began to remove its stones to be used for the construction of their own houses and churches. We know that originally it was a great bridge with 11 arches. The ruin of this marvel is somewhat regrettable. But it gives us a great opportunity. By exposing its insides, we can observe the details of its interior and understand or deduce some of the techniques that were employed in its construction. Analyzing what were unseen parts of the bridge, the first thing that surprises us is the carefully and meticulous adjustment of the ashlars, the massive square cut stone blocks. Intuitively, we might think that such precision of fit and placement would hardly be necessary if it were not to be visible, but that is far from the reality. The tighter the fit and the greater the area of contacting surfaces of the stones, the more overall solidity is achieved. And we can see another element that highlights the care and consistency of the work. Recesses in the stones in the form of a double dovetail can be seen whereby a piece of wood, sometimes sealed with lead, was embedded in the stone to form a kind of staple to join the stones and make them difficult to budge. This staple has disappeared because wood will rot away in time. We also note holes in the stone that were used to move them by means of pegs that were placed in the holes. This was an ingenious mechanism devised to lift the ashlars. It consisted of two metal wedges that were introduced wide end first into a rectangular slot cut into the stone. The narrow ends of the slot were cut wider inside the stone than the slot itself, so the interior of the hole was a triangular space, allowing the metal wedges to move wider inside the hole. Spacers were added between the wedges so that they went wide and could not fall back, thus becoming locked in the hole. The assembly could then be raised by a pulley, allowing lifting and placement. At the start of the surviving arch, we can perceive the curious shape of some dovelas that were intentionally oversized. It might seem that they were made in this way for aesthetic reasons. 
but the reality is very different. To lift some columns and place a lintel across them, you only need to hoist the columns and place the lintel. But the construction of an arch requires holding every one of the dovelas until the last one, called the keystone, is placed. That's when the mechanics of the arch come into play, locking the structure into place, and equilibrium is achieved. We therefore have the problem of holding the dovelas in place until the last one is placed. How was this achieved? The answer is by building a temporary wooden framework called a simbra. A simbra is a wooden structure that provisionally holds the dovelas in position. On this bridge, the simbra was supported on brackets. When the last dovella, the keystone, was placed in its position at the highest point at the center of the arch, the arch was complete and the wooden framework could be disassembled to be used in the construction of the next arch. The rules governing the forces involved in the building of arches and vaults are complex. The greater the span, the larger the arches or vaults. The forces generated by them require the dimensions and thicknesses of all the components increase considerably, as do the difficulties. Not only the difficulties of the design, but also of the construction of the building. These difficulties meant that the use of the arch was not available to all ancient civilizations. However, Rome managed to understand and master those rules and erect works of a unique complexity and beauty. In many cases, unsurpassed to this day. We will go to the Spanish town of Alcantara, in the province of Cáceres. Alcantara is a small town with just 1,500 inhabitants, but its charm, its gastronomy and its traditions have made it a beautiful tourist destination. Its historical heritage makes a very significant contribution to those qualifications. The name Alcantara comes from the Arabic term Alcantarat, which means the bridge. The Muslims gave this name to the site, when upon arriving at this place in the 8th century, they were undoubtedly impressed to discover this superb and imposing bridge, the so-called Puente de Alcantara. The impressive Alcantara bridge needs to cross the deep valley of the river Tagus, hence its dimensions. It is 194 meters in length and stands 58 meters high. After almost 2,000 years of history, the Alcantara bridge continues to fulfill its function, supporting modern traffic to the amazement of travelers. The Alcantara Bridge is an engineering marvel in many ways. It is worth mentioning especially the two central arches, one with a span of almost 29 meters and the other spanning 28 meters, as well as the two adjoining arches, both of about 23 meters. Modern engineers who have studied the subject understand very well the complexity of the forces and stressing acting on arches of these dimensions. This was well known to Roman technicians who knew perfectly well that with such large arches, increasing the span by a single meter would greatly increase the difficulties. However, it seems that this encouraged Roman engineers to tackle increasingly bold projects. Let us go next to the Aosta Valley in northwestern Italy. The river Dora Baltea 
runs through the Aosta Valley. It encompasses the northern part of the Savoyard Alps and the western part of the Apennine Alps. Within it are the largest mountains in Europe, many of them exceed 1,000 meters in height, in a setting of majestic and beautiful alpine scenery. The Aosta Valley is now an important crossroads, as it was also in antiquity. Important Roman roads converged here, which made this valley a strategic location. Building roads in such an extreme setting demands enormous constructive effort. That is why here in the Aosta Valley, we can find spectacular road cuttings made by working the rock with hammer and chisel. There are also imposing retaining walls. And of course, many bridges. One such bridge is this, the Bridge of San Martín, that takes its name from that of the nearby small municipality. The majesty of this impressive building fueled the popular imagination, attributing its construction to the devil. Because it was incomprehensible that such size, perfection and grandeur came from the ingenuity or the hand of man. The single arch of the Bridge of San Martín reaches 35.84 meters of span. Six meters more than the main arch of the Bridge of Alcántara. We now know, thanks to modern engineering, that these dimensions are very close to the structural limit that can be reached. There is no known surviving semicircular arch in stone that has a wider span than this one. When Rome subdued the Salasi, the indigenous people of the Aosta Valley, they founded a city that received the name of Augusta Praetoria Salasorum. This enclave was one of the most important Roman strongholds in the Alps. Heir to this Roman city is the modern city of Aosta, which gives its name to the valley. Aosta preserves many remains of its Roman past. In them, we have spectacular examples of the use of the arch. Among them, the great triumphal arch of Augustus, which used to greet the visitor upon arrival at the city. Another good example is the so-called Praetoria Gate, the entry to the city from the eastern approach. It is a gate comprising three arches. The central arch is for vehicles, those on either side for pedestrians. We can see that the gate still retains some original marble tiles, showing that the entire exterior was once completely tiled, and it lets us envisage how magnificent this gate must have been. This is an exceptional place where we can observe the extreme precision with which Roman stonemasons sometimes trimmed the stone blocks. If we observe carefully, the precision is perfect. It is difficult to perceive the joints between the stones. It is necessary to get very close and look carefully to find them. Remember that the more contact there is between the stone surfaces, the more solid is the structure. Undoubtedly, due to the precise jointing of its stones, this arch is, for all practical purposes, as if it were a monolithic object. Really stunning and wonderful. The Roman architects who achieved this have our utmost admiration. As we have seen, the accuracy in which Roman technicians made and adjusted the stone blocks was amazing. This has always generated many questions about the techniques that were used to achieve such precision. 
to try and answer some of these questions, we will move to El Medol, a place located just over seven kilometers from Taraco, the ancient city that today is Tarragona. El Medol is a curious place located in the mountains near Tarragona. It is a huge hole created in the mountain by the continuous working of a quarry. One of the many quarries from which were extracted the numerous large blocks of stone that were necessary to raise the imposing constructions in Taraco. It has been estimated that about 150,000 cubic meters of rock were extracted from El Medol alone. The Roman stonemasons left a stone needle as a proof of having eventually reached a depth of more than 20 meters, and probably as a symbol of their domination over nature. Centuries of neglect have allowed vegetation to cover the place, hiding the work fronts and with them the valuable information of how this quarry was exploited. But in 2010, a forest fire exposed a multitude of marks and traces of extraction activity. The study of these clues helps us to understand how the quarry functioned. The negatives of the blocks are the remaining stone around the space where the block was extracted. They suggest a size of about 160 by 80 by 70 centimeters and over two metric tons in weight. The blocks to be cut were marked out with lines in the rock or with indentations made on one, two or three of its sides. Several marks indicate that wedges were used to fracture the rock and remove the blocks. The layout of the quarry clearly indicates the circulation areas, the control points and the places of entry and exit for personnel. There were also areas for supplies such as material and tools. as well as a resting facility for workers, in which even areas of worship have been found. And the workshop area is perfectly defined, where the blocks were processed and shaped. The marks on the stone blocks found in the workshop area, and on some offcuts, reveal the type of tools that were used to bring the stone blocks approximately to their intended shape. The stone blocks of El Medol were prepared to a shape somewhat approximate to what was needed. Then they were transferred to Taraco to be used in the great constructions. We find ourselves where one of the two great towers stood that communicate with downtown Taraco, where its great provincial forum once stood. This great construction has been badly damaged by the plundering of its stone, and much of its foundations and walls were used to construct new buildings. By interpreting the remains, we will reconstruct the building. In the process, we will have the opportunity to discover some curious construction details and try to answer the question that has brought us here. How did the Romans achieve such a precise machining of the stone blocks? The original access to the tower was through this door. Only a few ashlars in the upper part, very poorly preserved, are original. But inside, their excellent conservation lets us see the result of the wonderful technique used and the incredible connection with which the technicians made these blocks. In the square design of the door, a lintel formed by Dovelas was chosen. As with the arches, the middle stone is called a keystone. In this door, you can see the shape given to some of the Dovelas with the side faces in the shape of Z, achieving a kind of latching. The objective of this latching is to prevent the dovelas from sliding, one with the other, due to any minute mismatch caused by the slightest movement. That is why this technique was widely used in areas where earthquakes were frequent, and it is really extraordinary to find them in this part of the empire.
The square design was undoubtedly chosen for aesthetics, but it presented a problem. How is it that this lintel, which was also not a single or monolithic beam, could support the enormous weight of the wall that is above it? The answer is found up here, where we can see something that goes unnoticed by non-expert eyes. A blind arch embedded in the construction of the wall, which is nothing more than a discharge arch. The purpose of this arch, as its name suggests, is to discharge the forces caused by the enormous weight of the wall above it and transfer them to the sides of the door. In this way, the lintel is freed of forces that it would probably not withstand. And on the other side, we see the staircase that reveals the function of the tower. Through it, citizens could access from the lower part of the city to the great provincial forum and to the hidden doorway that opened from its side. And it also gave access to the upper stands of the circus, both from the lower part of the city as well as from the hidden doorway and the provincial forum. As with the Lunel Bridge that is partially dismantled, we can see numerous construction details that were hidden from sight. Again, the size of the stone blocks and the precision even in hidden parts of the structure is impressive. We can see the holes of the staples in the form of a double dovetail, intending to pin the blocks together. And we have the detail of this curious block, which is slightly displaced from its position, revealing an attempt to move it. And here, we have a detail that has also been exposed, but that has gone unnoticed even by modern scholars. And that is what will allow us to answer how the Roman builders achieved such precise adjustments. In this block, we can see two curious horizontal holes. If we insert our fingers, we can see that these holes angle upwards 90 degrees. This curious shape allows the stone blocks to be moved back and forth with simply adapted tools, causing the surfaces of the stones to create a friction between them. Thanks to the great weight of the blocks, this friction caused enormous wear. By repeating this process a few times and sweeping away the resulting sand, a controlled wear of the surfaces was achieved allowing an almost perfect fit. Stone was the construction material par excellence for public buildings in ancient times, but as we have seen, extracting and handling huge stones involves significant difficulties and requires appropriate efforts. Some cultures prior to the Roman already knew that the mixing of lime, sands and water formed a very hard and solid cement, allowing very sturdy buildings to be constructed. The Romans found a way to improve this mixture. We will travel to Tharagotha, known in ancient times as the great city of Caesar Augusta. Tharagotha is a prosperous and modern city, the fifth most populous city in Spain. Of its valuable historical and artistic heritage through the ages, the Roman remains are what stand out, since the current Zaragoza is built on the great Caesar Augusta. A large city founded by order of Emperor Augustus is a place of retirement for his legionary veterans. The grandeur of Caesar Augusta is manifested as archeological excavations on the present day city uncovering the remains of the great Roman city. The information obtained by the study of these remains is helping us to resurrect the great Caesar Augusta. In 1972, 
a local inhabitant alerted the press to the presence of archaeological remains on a building site in the city. Subsequent archaeological excavations uncovered them. Today they can be admired here, next to this magnificent museum. Roman engineers built the foundations and walls of this structure with a material different from the huge ashlars that covered it. A hard and resistant material which has endured until now. This material is Roman concrete, a mixture that they call cement or opus cementitium. The Romans made concrete by mixing aggregates of the best quality and solidity, often transported from far away if unavailable locally with good quality lime and water, all in the correct proportions. The mixture at the beginning is fluid and easy to handle and could be shaped into almost anything with the use of wood frames, wooden structures of temporary use as molds. Soon the dough solidifies, creating a material of extreme hardness and resistance. The wooden molds could then be removed and used elsewhere. We can see in many of these remains the imprint of the grain of the wooden planks used for the framework. With the ability to tackle almost any geometry with this material, the engineers took advantage of the knowledge they had on arches and vaults to build ingenious and daring structures in concrete. Structures like this, the internal structure that supported the stands of the great Roman theatre of Caesar Augusta. An excellent design, this structure supported all the weight of the edifice that was constructed on it. Thousands of ashlars, marble plaques and dozens of columns and statues. And of course, also the weight of all the spectators who were entertained there. The Caesar Augusta Theatre was one of the largest in Hispania, capable of accommodating about 6,000 spectators. A huge edifice built with precious marbles and masterfully worked ashlars. During the decline of the city, the building was plundered and came to this. Its marble and stone ashlars were torn out. Then its foundations were hidden from view for centuries by newer, more modest constructions. Finally, to be rediscovered only recently, their value recognized once again and displayed in this spectacular museum of the Roman theater of Caesar Augusta. As we have seen, a large internal structure supported the great theater of Caesar Augusta. An achievement of design and construction that easily goes unnoticed when the project is completed. There is another important element that goes even more unnoticed, yet a fundamental feature of every building, the foundations. We will go to the Spanish city of Merida, the town that was once the great colony Augusta Emerita. Merida is located in the southwest of the Iberian Peninsula and is currently a town of about 60,000 inhabitants. Merida has a truly extraordinary heritage of treasures. Aqueducts, temples, baths, monasteries, convents, churches, and neighborhood communities make up the legacy of its varied history. Of all this history, the Roman era was the most intense. The Roman legacy that has survived in Merida is truly superb. In the heart of Merida, we find the impressive remains of the Temple of Diana. 
Like that of the Temple of Augustus in Parsino, it is lentiled. Near the Temple of Diana, we find the corner of one of the monumental porticos of the Colonies Forum. To the north, 15 meters high and almost 9 meters wide, we find the Arch of Trajan. Its dovelas are one and a half meters long. When you entered the city, Trajan's Arch welcomed you as you passed into the Cardo Maximus, one of the main streets. To the west, we see part of the concrete structure that supported the circus. A colossal edifice more than 400 meters long. Capable of accommodating about 30,000 spectators. To the south, the remains of the amphitheater similar in size to that of Taraco, but better preserved. And those of the theater, practically identical in size to that of Caesar Augusta, but partially rebuilt. Spectacular bridges of Emerita Augusta have survived. This one, leaving the city to the north that crosses the Albarregas River. With four arches that reach 125 meters in length and almost eight in width. And the one that crosses the Guadiana River on the southeast side of the city. 60 arches to reach an impressive 790 meters in length. the longest bridge from Roman antiquity to have survived. Impressive bridges that deserve more time to get to know them better, but unfortunately, we will not be able to deal with them in detail. But let's stop now for a moment on the bridge that crosses the Guadiana to reflect on its foundations. The riverbed of the Guadiana at this point is full of sediment and is very muddy. Building on such a surface represents a real challenge. A bridge of these characteristics, whose weight, together with the traffic it had to support, could reach a very considerable total weight. A weight actually capable of sinking the structure into the soft ground, displacing it and disengaging the dovelas and so destroying the entire bridge. To solve this problem, it is necessary to design and build excellent foundations, foundations capable of reaching the bedrock. The connection between the hard bedrock and the columns on which the arches would sit could be achieved in a variety of ways by driving wooden piles to make a platform on which the base of the massive pillar will be constructed, resting on the piles, or by building caissons, watertight wooden boxes, enclosing the area where the base of the column or pillar will sit. The soft soil or mud can then be removed from the coffer dam and the base for the supporting columns settled into the space, vacated by the mud. A pile driving system could also be arranged inside the cofferdam if necessary, if the mud or soft earth is too deep for the cofferdam to reach the bedrock. Another possibility is what we believe was used on this Augusta Emerita bridge. Remove the soft mud from the caisson and replace it with concrete, the massive base being built on top of the concrete foundation. We can also take advantage of this bridge to look at another common detail in many Roman constructions. Let's look closely at the holes drilled into the dovelas. 
we can see that the hole in the keystone is positioned at the top center. And then we see that the holes in the other dovelas are all in different positions. The position of the hole reflects the sequence and position of the dovella in the completed arch. The hole was also used to lift the dovelas into position. All heavy stones were lifted by an ingenious combination of pulleys. But differing types of stone needed differing methods. Let's remember, for example, the use of the peg, which we saw in use on the Lunel Bridge. Massive ashlars could be moved by using ropes, looped around stone projections deliberately left by the masons. And for dovelas, another method was used, the lifting tolls. Due to the position chosen for the lifting hole, the center of gravity of a dovella ensured that it would hang at the correct angle required for it to be placed into its intended position in the arch without much further positioning after being lowered. The builders calculated where the lifting hole should be drilled so that the stone was lowered into position at the correct angle, greatly simplifying the placement process. Thousands more structures and buildings deserve our attention, but that would be impossible because we would need a documentary hundreds of hours long. But there is one building that we cannot ignore, but are forced to visit, because it represents a milestone in the history of mankind's mastery of construction skills. It would be unforgivable of us not to stop to admire and marvel at such a display of engineering expertise. We will go to Rome, the Eternal City. The number of great works and the richness of the priceless gems of construction that Rome retains from its imperial past is amazing. Down the ages, ordinary citizens from around the world even when they had no instruction or training in such matters, have found these treasures to be truly overwhelming. But many of these works, which amaze and overwhelm everyone, are engineering works so impressive that not everyone will always appreciate the full extent of their ingenuity and technical innovation. Hidden among the narrow streets of the Trevi district, very close to Piazza Navona, is the Pantheon of Agrippa, surely one of the best preserved works of Roman engineering in all of Rome. The architect who designed the Temple of Agrippa planned a portico of 34 by 16 meters, with 16 impressive monolithic columns of gray granite brought from Egypt almost one and a half meters in diameter, 12 meters high, and about 80 tons in weight. And crowned by huge Corinthian capitals two and a half meters high. Behind the portico, there is an intermediate body that connects with a large circular space. Around the periphery of this circular space, on the lower level, seven large exedra, rooms with alternating trapezoidal and semicircular open-plan floors, all of them framed by an order of pilasters and columns. A row of windows makes up a second level. On this second level, a dome is supported, in the center of which an oculus of nine meters in diameter opens. The data from the dome of the Pantheon of Agrippa from the point of the view of engineering is really amazing. Its immense diameter is 43.56 meters, making it the largest mass concrete dome ever built by man. This would be a colossal challenge even for any engineer today, but was met almost 2,000 years ago by the architect Apollodorus of Damascus. He was commissioned by Emperor Hadrian in 118 CE to build the Pantheon. 
Its design was so successful that the prodigious work has endured until today without renovations or reinforcements and has even survived plundering and earthquakes. How did Apollodorus of Damascus do it? The analysis and study of the building explains the design and genius of his construction technique. Apollodorus employed a combination of several construction techniques. Between the cornice on which the base of the dome would stand and the oculus which would be at the top of the dome was built a dome-shaped light wooden framework, a cimbra. The dome would be built of seven successive concentric rings of concrete starting at the base, the cornice. These self-supporting rings were built by overlapping layers of concrete forming a continuous integrated body. As the concrete in each layer hardened, it would become self-supporting so that the Simbra never needed to bear a heavy load. As each ring progressed, it became part of the integral structure whose growing weight was all borne by the cornice. The thickness of the dome was reduced from 5.9 meters of the first ring to one and a half meters of the last. Another key element used to minimize the weight of the dome was the incorporation of decorative sunken panels on the inside surface of the dome. Additionally, very light porous stone, volcanic pumice, was deliberately chosen for the concrete mix, conferring not only great strength but an extraordinarily low weight. They even used different types of aggregate with decreasing weight as they ascended towards the oculus. Although these techniques combined to reduce the weight of the dome, its final weight was 4,535 tons. An impressive figure. The original appearance of the Pantheon of Agrippa has changed a lot, as today it is without the polished stone and bronze that envelop the dome. Its original appearance must have been even more striking. But without a doubt, what should really impress anyone was to actually be inside the building. Here, architecture and engineering greatness are taken to their maximum expression, and the sensation of the reality of human prowess is overwhelming. It's very hard to describe how a visitor feels when inside this miraculous construction, especially when they can appreciate something of the science that went into it. We're at the end of our episode. In it, we have understood the ambition and capacity of the Roman civilization to innovate when designing and constructing great works in a manner not achieved by any other civilization. We have understood the techniques and types of structures that Roman architects and engineers designed and constructed. and how they masterfully took maximum advantage of whatever opportunities and construction materials were available to them. We have learned of some of the techniques and machines they developed to mine, transport, handle and build with massive stones and other construction materials. We have contemplated and analyzed some of the most relevant and admirable works of the empire, ending with the marvel of the Pantheon of Agrippa, one of the most extraordinary and inspirational constructions in the history of humanity. But the great works of Roman civilization go far beyond bridges, cities and buildings. The Roman ports are impressive works of engineering, as admirable as they are unknown today. We will have the opportunity to discover them, know them, understand them, and admire them in the next episode. See you in Roman Engineering Ports.